I, I thank Steve Bailey because I think these some of these meetings are historical get-togethers. I mean, when will that ever happen again? Once gigs picking up and everyone is busy, you know, everyone has different. John Patitucci is there on a regular basis. I'm like, wow. I've had such a great time getting to know today's guest. What a cool career he's had. And he was actually my last in-person interview before the pandemic began. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And we're talking today with Christian Fabian, who we've had on the podcast. This is the third time he was on with Rodney Jordan to talk about their latest album. And before Rodney joined us, Christian and I had a chance to chat. And it just kind of became its own episode. So you're going to hear what Christian has been up to since the pandemic began. He has been studying with Ron Carter for the last several years so he also talks a lot about what ron has been up to and he's just a brilliant guy i really love what he's got going on definitely check out christianfabian.com for more info and a quick thank you to our sponsors upton bass carnegie mellon university double bass studio and ear trumpet labs more on them later but let's dig into this conversation with christian fabian it sounds like New York is is in a similar situation. Things are gigs are coming back and I yeah, know, I mean, yeah, I, I've been um, I, I've been kind of on and off playing since November. Actually, there's this piano player friend of mine who was really smart. He was in uh, he lives in Hoboken and he went to a restaurant. He knows the owners and the owner's daughter is a trumpet player, but also played piano. And he just said, "Can I set up my piano here?" He's been playing ever since uh, five days a week. And first he did just solo, then he invited some people. And so he's been asking me occasionally since November to do some duo gigs, you know, and then um, it kind of started picking up in uh, a couple of Zoom things really picked up in January, February. We did a live Zoom thing with the Line Hemp Big Band. And then after that, I think since April, it's, um, you know, I did I did a couple of weddings, um, filling in for a friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, did like a uh, thing in a country club and um, and different things. So, I mean, it's definitely um, definitely picking up. Yeah, that's great. I mean, not, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, it's, it's cool. And I got some recording. You know, this is the second recording session I'm having, and um, I did something else I forgot. But it's it's little by little. You know, it adds up. It's it's coming back together. Good, it's good, really cool. Yeah, well, it's great, to, and we're seeing similar things here in San Francisco, and things, and you know, uh, the the orchestras are announcing their seasons, and uh, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, that, so that's that's been that's been heartening to see after a long. Yeah, long are you? Time. Uh do you, do you do orchestra gigs or what, what do you do? Yeah. In terms of my own playing. Yeah. I sub in the San Francisco symphony that it's my, yeah. I, I, my playing is mostly orchestra related. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, so it's, it's been nice to have, you know, see some of that come back. And then I do a lot of travel through my yeah. various endeavors. And so I, I do a lot of playing like bass ensembles, bass duos, yeah. uh, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. And so last week I was in LA for a bass, a bass festival. And then I was in Indiana, oh, uh, just a few days ago for, for uh, another bass, kind of like a, uh, bass finishing school sort of event. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're definitely, you're definitely well connected. That's awesome. You know, that's great. <laughs> Well, it's been nice. I, I, I didn't leave the city of San Francisco for uh, over a year, you know, which is uh -huh. crazy to, 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 but that it's good to, good to be seeing things coming back and opening back yeah. up and yeah, all that great, kind of great, stuff. Great, great, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for being open to wanting, you know, able to do this podcast. I mean, I'm, um, I mentioned to you the dual CD. I mean, we're going to wait for Rodney. I don't know what time is it. Is it five o'clock? Yeah. It's just a couple, a few minutes after five. So, oh, okay, great. But okay, there's going to come on. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Hey, the door. Well, thank you. That, you my know, friend. Thank oh no. I, I, I'd love, I love having people on multiple times and yet, you know, you, you yeah. do cool projects. So we got to, I'd, I'd love to, you know, yeah. anything you're doing, it's great yeah. to find time to, to yeah. so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, um, you know, Barry Green got back to me. Um, yeah, I was really trying to get access on, um, if possible of that uh, duo presentation he did, you know, so I, I, I did wrote, uh, Madeline and a couple of emails, you know, but it seems like she's very busy. I never heard back from her. So, but he came back, uh, he responded. I, I asked for the phone number. So I think I'm going to call her up and see if I can talk to her. It's a, a much for, uh, I mean, I don't know. Is there a certain agreement you had with the ISP in terms of the fundraiser or? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's they—they they were just going to take all the content after the after the event okay. was over. 
Oh so, yeah, so I don't have I don't have anything. I just have Madeline yeah, yeah. email. <laughs> so yeah. you know, um, but yeah, I, I mean, they should have. I, it makes sense to. It shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I don't know why communication. Wait, 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 weird with it her. was your idea. Is it correct? Was it your yeah, idea? It, to put it together? Barry, Barry, together. Had, yeah, Barry and I had the idea, but then we partnered up with the ISB, and then the yeah. uh, the, the the agreement was all of all of that footage would just go to the ISB archives, and it was done. Yeah. So. Okay, great, so, great, yeah, great, so, great, great. So, but yeah, that was fun. That was, uh, it, it seems like that was forever ago, but I guess it was only like a little over <laughs> a year ago. You know, I can't, it's been a weird year. Yeah, yeah. You worked really hard to put that all together. That's amazing. You know, yeah, it was, really... it was fun. It was the, the, uh, but it's nice to be starting to see in person base events happening again. It was fun to connect and I, uh, you know, online. And that was, that was really cool to see all that kind yeah. of. But it's also nice to finally see, you know, I'm seeing some things overseas, like the Dutch Double Bass Festival has been announced wow. in October. So hopefully that'll happen. I know things are weird in Europe, like travel restrictions and trying to get to Europe. I, how? So you're talking about Ho Hoboken. Is that where you've been playing that gig? The Yeah, Hoboken. Okay. Is an, uh, the, the main drag in Hoboken, the name of the street called Washington Street. Mm -hmm. And there's a restaurant, or, uh, like, um, I mean, it's been there forever. I mean... One of my students, uh, he came and, and uh, I just texted him. I know he lives around the corner. I said, hey, you want to come? And he came by and, and he said to me, you know, I, I, I rented this room downstairs for like, you know, all kinds of uh, family occasions. And I know these are new owners. I mean, they took the uh, place over five years ago. And, um, but it's been around for 20, 25 years called Amanda's. Mm. And... Um, yeah, so so that it's it's very spacious for Hoboken. I don't know if you're familiar with Hoboken. It's a it's a it's a small. I mean, it's a lot of people living there, but it's like a square mile, and um, you know the um, it's it's still pretty spacious for such a small area. And um, you know they had the table spaced out, and and my friend was pretty you know he was pretty laid back. So you know once we were playing, we didn't have to wear a mask and. And then, you know, they, um, I mean, it was not really, um, he was a piano player. He's kind of a solo piano player and he just wanted to play and they didn't pay him. So we just played for tips and, and then, and I, I was just like, oh, great. I want to play, you know, <laughs> so I'm like they gave you food, a really good restaurant. I mean, it's really, um, really, really good food. So I pretty much had a steak every time I played. <laughs> That's 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 pretty great, especially, especially after like a, a hiatus of playing. It's got to be great. Yeah, to have yeah. had something regular like that. That's uh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it was it was great. Uh, it's still great. And then, but it was kind of interesting. He um, he first he said, "Oh, you have no idea how many people turn me down because they want to play for for tips." You know, I'm like, well, you know, that's kind of like strange. You would think everyone would be just like, "Hey, whatever." I just want to play, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I understood that the restaurant never, uh, didn't have too much. I mean, we played some nights where there were like four or five parties. Mm -hmm. They had a kind of staff. You had the cook and a couple of waiters. And uh, I mean, I get the idea that, you know, that there was not a lot of money, you know, but I mean, I thought it's a great idea to keep up your repertoire and, and just keep playing. And um, it was funny. He was, um, I was it was close to a year, you know, and I kept uh, I kept studying with uh, with Ron Carter the entire time, and I was really curious to see how my chops were feeling, and and it was it was funny because my fingers and my chops were there, but my brain, you know, it's like I was just like slow, you know, like mm -hmm. you know we we used the Irie book and we just were going through talks and we played whatever we wanted to play, but it's just like there was something happening in my brain because I hadn't played in a while. I didn't think the fingers were the problem, which you would think, uh, you know, that that your fingers are. But you know, with with Ron, we do a lot of the you know classical exercises and tone and making sure you have a good sound. So, but I I even told him I said you know somehow things are not really connecting up there. And uh, so that was that was that's what I noticed, you know. But I, I mean, I had no blisters. I'm like, oh, this is great, you know. I'm like, I'm ready for more. And it, it took like two or three get togethers and, and playing and then I kind of felt like I was really back you know but it was more on my mind than my fingers I had to you know with, with jazz you know you improvise the bass lines and everything and this is kind of like it was just really strange anyway it was just um, I felt like in the twilight zone somehow you know anyway it was a, a little um, 
uh, different. But I'm glad I took the, uh, you know, Ron did it. He went with the in-person lesson actually till about March, end mm. of March. And then he switched over to Skype. So we had Skype lessons. And then he is very connected to the uh, Berkeley Base Department. He's doing a lot of, um, I don't know if you joined any of the Berkeley Base Department uh, Zoom mm -hmm. get-togethers, but um, they have the teachers, several teachers from all over the United States, they, they have this call on Wednesday night. So he got really... Um, He's close to Steve Bailey and, and, and Victor Wooten, and he went to these um, Zoom meetings, and then they uh, Steve Bailey and Victor Wooten helped him to get ready with, you know, helped him for the Zoom setup. And then it, I think sometime in the uh, late summer, he switched over to Zoom. And, um, and then we had, um, you know, he would send out for my lessons spotters on Saturday, so he would send out and... Um, he would send out an email with a Zoom link. And it was funny because if I went in too early, you know, I could see the lesson from the previous guy. <laughs> or if I had, if I was at the end of the lesson, I saw another guy popping in on the screen. Yeah. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, he figured that one out. So he had the waiting room installed and everything. It's really interesting to see him develop through this, um, uh, throughout this whole time. And, and now he's doing a lot of stuff on Zoom. He has a, uh, Q&A uh, on his Facebook site. I don't know if you saw that. He's doing uh, some short interviews. He had like Lenny White and Herbie Hancock, Diana Crawl. He has this little quiz he developed where he asked the musicians certain questions. And uh, he his Facebook following really grew. I, I think he's over, I don't I don't know, maybe I thought he was over 100,000, but... Uh, He's doing a lot of advertising. He came out with a lot of books. Um, he came out with a lot of... Um, the latest one is really interesting. He used the song Autumn Leaves. And there are five recordings from, I think, from the early 60s. up Anywhere between 61 and 64, 62 and 64. He had... Um, he transcribed these five versions of Autumn Leaves. Hmm. Uh, I think the first 16 bars and then he compared them and it's amazing to see that it's uh, he talks about how the baseline developed over time and um, it's an eye opener for me it was an eye opener because um, a lot of the things he teaches in his lessons was really reflecting in in this uh, transcription book i mean you could really see he's it's funny him and my other teacher mike long who uh, passed away unfortunately he um both of them are not really into transcription because for them the music is uh, in jazz it's like a it's like an the bass player reacts to whatever is going on there in the in this musical moment so both of them have this um uh, idea of they think what does it do you any good if you transcribe that because the environment who uh, is responsible for the musicians to react a certain way is gone I mean that mm -hmm. was a one time thing you know I mean of course you know Mike always said it's great for analyzing and see what you can do but um, you know in, in that sense both of them are not you know not not advocates of like, hey, you got to transcribe 20 solos and do this and this and this, and that will show you how to play. Uh, maybe, you know, but it doesn't really help you for how to react to um, your environment. So, so it was really interesting to see these five transcriptions um, next to each other. And it, it's really, everyone is, uh, is a lot different than the previous one. And it's really interesting how they how they played the um, ensemble playing, how they interact with each other. And uh, one of the things he said, it's interesting to see how Miles plays because, um, you know, we would have the idea that when he said he's not playing on top of us, he's playing within us. He's mm. inside the band, you know, and... Uh, it's very obvious, you know, you, you can hear him taking breaks for a couple of beats, maybe a measure and, and really reacting to the environment. So 
as an improvising musician, I was like, wow, you know, the the um, I I really um, I really have a better understanding. Although he talks about it all the time, but actually to see that, and in my case, my my Davis happened to be my favorite all time musician. So um, to see him in that quintet and how it all came together, it was just like, wow, it's really, it's really cool. So he, um, you know, came up with that book and a couple of other books, and so uh, it really started after last summer that he got really active promoting his material. And uh, it's really cool. You know, I, I find it inspiring. This episode is brought to you by the Carnegie Mellon University Double Bass Studio. Located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Pittsburgh is brimming with culture. It's home to the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. It also has the Pittsburgh Opera, Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, and so many other great institutions. And Micah Howard and team have created such a dynamic program. I am such a fan. I've gotten the chance to visit a couple of times for the Pittsburgh Double Bass Symposium. Highly, highly recommend learning more about them. They have placed students in so many great positions throughout the country and beyond and you can sign up for a free online trial lesson with micah visit micahbhoward.com to sign up and learn more and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast when i was recently chatting with gary and eric of upton base i asked them how did they do what they do how do they build their presence and be so top of mind among bassists around the world here's what they said my ego doesn't want to say this right and eric's won't like it either but because of the timing we couldn't do again what we've done yeah and what they have done is absolutely extraordinary from their beginnings as an accessories shop online to now making over 120 bases a year they're coming up as i record this on 1700 bases they've got an army of satisfied customers who bought multiple bases they're just really doing great things they do great work and stand behind their products check them out at uptonbase.com and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast guys you know, I mean, as you know, there's some ups and downs to Zoom, but it took me quite a while to really appreciate the uh, the benefits you have, especially if you, um, I followed a lot of the Berkeley Bass Department Zoom get-togethers. And I mean, I remember this one Zoom meeting, you know, I had like Marcus Miller, Daryl Jones, Buster William, Ron Carter, Dave Holland. <laughs> I mean, you had like John Clayton, <laughs> I was just like, I was just like, oh my God, you know, I mean, (laughs) I, you know, I mean, I I thank Steve Bailey because I think these, some of these meetings are historical get togethers. I mean, when will that ever happen again? Once gigs picking up and everyone is busy, you know, everyone has different, John Patitucci is there on a regular basis. I'm like, wow. Um, You know, that, that, that was really, um, that's very inspiring. So that's one of the benefits of Zoom. And uh, I can see, uh, although I'm not really ready um, working with someone on, on a book idea and we have some layouts, I'm, I'm, I feel so much still as a student that, you know, but there's a few things I notice I do with my students, which I haven't seen in any other teaching methods. So I, I think it's inspiring to see that how people come out with different materials and do something. And I'm like, oh, you know, you should, uh, I, I really have not seen the certain thing I'm doing with my students because it had me. And I notice, in terms of my teaching, I usually, it's funny, I don't know, I know you're teaching too, but how you attract sometimes students who have the same problems you had, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. so you it's like, oh, wow. You know, it's like, you know, so it really had me. And I'm like, you know, and I, I, I over the years I've, see this over and over uh, passing on this concept a couple of them you know I'm like well maybe I should put them in the book you know maybe maybe I do have you know something to add to the facet of this diamond everyone has something mm-hmm. you know everyone mm-hmm. has a different perspective I'm like oh you know maybe I am um... so we started putting some material together but he he really um coming back to Ron I mean he really pumped out a couple of four or five books you know it's really I'm like wow that's, um, you know, I don't know if they were already in the works and he just had a chance to finish them or the transcription book. I do know that that um, that and I, that's an idea he got last year and then he started working on that and put that together. Wow. Um, 
Well, he's an inspiring guy. I mean, you look at all he's done. He's not resting on his laurels, and, and <laughs> to see and to see what he's done, and to see him, uh, you know, sort of uh, seize upon the, this moment and the technology and understand it and work with it yeah. and with the interviews. I mean, it's really cool. And that Berkeley-based department stuff, boy, I hope that Steve and those folks, I hope that they saved all that because they you're do. right. You're right. Like, when's when's the next time that everybody's just going to be hanging out at home? All those people. <laughs> when is another the next time you're going to have Dave Holland? and John Clayton and Ron Card and all these people free, yeah. you know, and just hang out, you know, so it's, it's really cool what Steve's yeah, been up to yeah. with those. But they, they have this thing called the base fault and it's like mm -hmm. something him and Victor developed. Uh, it's, I think it's a website and, and they do say that they make them available, but it's funny if you go to the Berkeley Base Department Facebook site, if there was a, um, you know, they had the Chikoria uh, tribute, they had a tribute to Rocco, uh, from Tower of Power, uh, they have, I mean, there's some, um, then they had one which blew my mind where they had all the different rhythm sections who played with uh, Miles Davis uh, throughout the years, drummers and bass players. And then they did the same with Chick Corea. They had the different rhythm sections who, who played with, uh, with Chick Corea. It was just like uh, really mind-blowing. Uh, and there was some really, how you call it, I get nuggets of wisdom and information. Mm -hmm. And then the Facebook site afterwards explodes. It's like, when do you want to post this? You know, when can we see this? You know, it's like, you know, it's, I, I, I'm sure there's tons of meetings and, and uh, I think it will be a big boom once they actually make it all available out there. I mean, there was some, there's, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm, I mean, there's a few of them I, I missed. I have to think about which one it was, but, um, I remember the one I participated. There was one uh, with Wayne Shorter. Uh, there was they had a special uh, edition about um, weather report. Um, the different bass players played with weather report. Uh, great ideas. I mean, then yeah. then they started adding something with um, uh, saxophone players, um, like different topics. Talking about uh, there was one with uh, Broadway bass players. You know, I was uh, um, able to follow. Then they had another one with them. Um, I know. I mean, I don't know. This, I, I think he's up to close to fifty of these uh, Zoom meetings. You know, so it's pretty amazing. I, I think that's very unique. I think when that becomes available, I think it's um, it's definitely a source of information, especially having people uh, seeing interacting with each other. I remember that. Um, I came up with a trio CD last year with Bernard Perdi on drums and an organ player. And um, I think it came out right after I saw you. Mm -hmm. And um, is Rodney texting to you? No, I don't think so. Oh, wait, I got a message. Let me look and see. Uh, oh, no, that's you. No, so I, oh, I didn't. Okay. Nope. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I got plenty to talk about. Um, so I, I, um, they were talking about rhythm sections with Steely Dan. I, I, um, I know Steve also through the Victor Wooten camps, which I, particip I partic participated in a couple of them, uh, three of them total. And then I went to a jam weekend and I went to a building weekend where he cleans up the forest and everything. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's very inspiring what he has put together there with his wife. And um, so I know, know Steve a little bit, so I've been texting him and said, hey, did you uh, think about Bernard Perdi to, to ask for the Steely Dan get together? It's like, no, I don't have his number. So I texted him his phone number. I know Bernard from, uh, it's a long story, but we started working together when the uh, original drummer of the Lionel Hampton Big Band passed away in 2009. His name was Wally Gator Watson. And um, I knew Wally was a really close friend with Bernard and I didn't know Bernard. And I would run into him frequently at the musicians' union, and I uh, would just say hi, you know. And didn't really have much to talk about. When we were playing, um, when when they had the wake for Wally Gator Watson in Brooklyn, there was a big jam session. I forgot the name guy's name, but he pulled together a bass player who played with George Benson, who was a close friend with Wally Gator. We call him Wally Gator. His full name is Wesley Watson. Mm. And um, so I just saw this big jam session 
at the wake, the casket was open and I just saw Bernard walking up to the casket and, you know, he did a prayer and, you know, and then he leaned over and he gave him a kiss on his forehead or his cheek. You know, I'm like, wow, you know, they're really close. So when Oligena passed away, I was doing these workshops on the Upper East Side for a uh, boy school called St. David's. And actually, at some point, we brought Lionel Hampton over there. Lionel Hampton was a big into music education. And he would always, when we played with a big band, uh, we always he always would make sure he goes by a school, meets the music teachers. I mean, that's when I joined the Hampton Big Band. It was always part of it to have, you know, meet students, you know, mm -hmm. inspire them. So when Walligata passed away, I'm like, wow, I should ask Bernard if he wants to come up to play at St. David's. We would do these workshops and we were connected to the music teacher. And, um, and he's kind of like, you know, he's like a teddy bear. He's funny. You know, he has a great aura around him. And, and, and Walligata was the same way. I mean, kids just loved him. You know, he would had like a hat and you would throw it in the audience. And I mean, I don't know, they just really related great to the, that young generation. So I, I, I approached him and said, you know, and I said, we're doing these and it doesn't pay a lot of money, you know? And I said, we, we do this for 10 years and would you be willing to join us instead of Wally? And he said, no question. Just tell me when and when I'll be there. <laughs> nice. And we're doing this workshop. We've been doing them for over 10 years. And funny thing, I was playing upright all the time on these workshops. Uh, so I asked him to do the CD and for four, four years, five years, four, four or five years ago, I had this idea. I love organ. I like when the organ is playing a walking bass and I like organ trio, but I always thought in my mind, how would the sound with the bass guitar? And so my mind, I always wanted to get my friend Ron Oslansky and Bernard Purdy together for an organ trio and play bass. And, um, and it happened. And um, so I got, um, you know, I, I, I got him together in the studio, but I remember when we were in the studio and played the first song, I got on my electric bass, Bernard was like, <laughs> he's like, you're playing electric bass? I didn't know you play electric bass. <laughs> I'm like, to me, it's kind of like, I didn't think, I don't know, it never occurred to me in my mind that I should mention that, you know. I, I told him about the organ trio, you know. I don't know what he was thinking, but, uh, but maybe he forgot. I mean, you know, but uh, I was starting to ask him. It took about two and a half to three years because I couldn't line up him with my friend Ron. They had a really busy schedule. So it finally, finally worked out. And um, so I, I um, you know, and I started working with, with, with Bernard. I don't know why I started this story, but uh, anyway, um, there was, yeah. was, oh, so the Berkeley, so I knew him really well. So I, I can text him, I can call him, I can send him an email and he responds right away. So I, I said, um, you know, you should really invite him to the Steely Dan uh, rhythm section. And so he did. So what's interesting about these Zoom meetings to experience is these musicians like Chuck Rainey and Bernard Perdi, Bernard Perdi and Ron Carter, they, they literally haven't seen each other in 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then see them in these Zoom meetings. It's like, hey, <laughs> that's just like, and you're like right there, you know, looking at your screen. And then, of course, you know, they kind of like have the thing and they want to catch up a little bit, you know, and you're right yeah. there. Like, whoa, man, that's, that's inspiring. I mean, that is, to me, um, although I didn't get too, too crazy about the Zoom than some of my other uh, bass colleagues and friends, but it took me a while. I'm like, this is really extraordinary to, to have these get-togethers on Zoom, you know? I'm like, wow, what a, what a great thing to do. And um, what I started doing last summer, I, I teach this workshop called the Sitka Jazz Workshop. And I was inspired by, uh, Steve Belly always has surprise guests, you know, like you're like, and I went to a Zoom meeting and then suddenly pops, someone pops in and like, I don't know, who was a brand from Marsalis or mm -hmm. someone else he asked, you know, like, whoa, <laughs> wow, <it's, laughs> that's, you know, you're like yeah. the world's colliding. And so I started doing that at the Sitka Jazz Workshop last summer. 
I, I, like, I just invited people. I, I you know, I, everyone is, if they have time, everyone I notice is always available, available for 20 minutes to pop in somewhere. It's like, hey, do you mm-hmm. want to come by? Mm-hmm. Talk about your new book and, and inspire some students, you know, and then, uh, you know, we had so, so uh, Victor Wooten came by, Ron Carter came by, and then usually one thing comes to the other, and then uh, Jimmy Owens, great trumpet player. So I got really inspired by that inviting guests, and you you could announce them or or you don't announce them, and then suddenly you are like in the middle of something, and then someone pops in, and you're like, whoa. It's, I, I thought, you know, that where does it happen? I mean, I mean, I know the visiting artist series at the Berkeley Bass Department was pretty crazy. I just talk about that because that's my former I'm a Archer. Mm-hmm. I'm a Martyr. Um, and we had like, you know, maybe Brian Bromber came by, Ray Brown came by one semester. Uh, I noticed Daryl Jones came by when he was playing with the Rolling Stones and just finished playing with Miles. But that was like a one-time thing in a four-month semester. Mm -hmm. Uh, When Steve Bailey started um, being the chairman, he would have, you know, in in one semester, you had John Clayton, you had Rocco, you had uh, John Paiutucci, Victor Wooten. I'm like, whoa, I mean, that's a great visiting artist series. But now with the Zoom, it kind of multiplied, you know, and it's just like, in a way, I'm like, wow, if I would be a student there, I mean, you know, I mean, it's super inspiring. But on the other hand, it can be also, I mean, I'm saying, I mean, I would, I only can take only so much, but I probably also would have a little overload. I mean, if you just get to know all these bass players, I I guess I had to, to me, it's amazing because I know them and learned them over the years. But if you're just a brand new guy coming out of high school, going into a program, I mean, you have to do a lot of research to, you know, I mean, you talk about, some bass players who have a vast recording history uh, behind them, you know, that like really to, you know, when you listen to, I'm, I'm really admiring Steve. I mean, he knows all the records, you know, I mean, he really knows a lot what those guys has been, have been doing. It's like, you know, I'm like, I'm sitting there just taking notes. I'm like, I mean, I got to check this out. <laughs> check this out. Uh, it's very inspiring. So that's, Talking about benefits of Zoom, I I found that a major benefit of the Zoom meetings. Yeah. Well, I hope that, yeah, what a great historical record. That's the sort of thing that I could imagine being like an incredible coffee table book for bass players or something. If someone went through and <laughs> transcribed some of those highlights of these meeting of the, you know, it's like a, that great, what is it, that great day in Harlem poster, you know, from the, whenever that was, you know, of all these. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Steve's an inspiring guy. I, I, it's yeah. cool. Want to follow along with what with what he's been up to, and yeah, it's uh, the, our principal bassist here in San Francisco. The symphony has been checking out a lot of those Zoom meetings. Scott Ping uh-huh. and and he's oh, wow. been really really enjoying them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the other thing. I mean, I learn about a lot of other uh, bass players, like the uh, the Broadway bass uh, get together. It was really I was. Um, I mean, I I love Broadway. You know. Uh, my girlfriend knows all the Broadway shows, you know, she's like a, a singer, actress, and, mm-hmm. and is really familiar with, 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 with all the stuff. And, and I'm familiar with some of the shows, you know, but not all of them. But just to meet all these bass players who had like, for years, the steady gig. And, and, uh, and I'm like, and they're all great players. I'm like, wow, I mean, I, I never heard of this guy. I never heard of her. Um, and, and some, you know, the, I forgot her name, but there is um, Victor Bailey has a niece, I think, who is a great bass player who's mm. playing. I think she's playing Hairspray. I forgot her name. But uh, so I, I wasn't familiar. I mean, I was familiar with her as a big band composer. I didn't know that, um, you know, that, that, that she was playing Hairspray. I'm like, oh, wow, that, that's amazing. You know, so talking about setup, sound. Uh, how to get ready for a show and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just like, how you say it? Just a freak or bass nerd? I mean, I'm like kind of like, you know, I'm intrigued by a bass by 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 a Broadway show. I mean, I like guys who go in there and just play it and subbing out, and you gotta know all your cues. I'm like, 
you know, I have a lot of respect. I mean, that takes, you know, I don't know how I would feel after five years, you know, but I'm, I, as a gig, and I admire that too. I mean, I know uh, Tom Barney uh, doing, playing the, the Lion King for 15 years now. I mean, or had been playing to, for a long time. I'm, I'm, I was sitting in uh, just watching him do the show and, and how he does everything. I'm like, wow, it's amazing. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. that's also a cool book. I, I like Lion King. I mean, that's really, I mean, there's some really great music in there. So um, I, I, I find it inspiring. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. These are hand-built microphones out of Portland, Oregon, and they make an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. Barry Green got to try out this mic at our 2020 Online Bass Summit where Ear Trumpet Labs was a sponsor, and he was singing its praises all weekend long. It's an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear, natural sound and great feedback rejection. It's durable and works with in-ears, monitors, you name it. Not to mention, Christian McBride, Barry Bales, and Missy Raines are all Nadine users. Whether it's classical, jazz, Americana, or bluegrass, this mic seriously delivers, and they're offering a free t-shirt, especially to Contrabass Conversations listeners with a purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and check out Nadine. I am so proud to have my course with Discover Double Bass, Beginner's Classical Bass, out in the world. This was a long time coming, friends, and this course is designed, as the name implies, for beginner bassists who want to learn how to play classical music or for more experienced players who wish to revisit the foundations of technique. The course is comprised of 66 lessons over four hours and covers a wide range of topics on classical bass, which will make a real difference to you playing. It is the perfect course for beginners. I feel weird saying that since it's my course, but I, I definitely believe in it, to build a solid foundation of double bass technique and to help you feel confident playing. Many of the Lessons include transcriptions of the pieces, exercises, and etudes, so you have everything you need to practice at home. I spent hundreds of hours putting this together over the last few years. I'm so glad to see it out in the world. We have a link to it in the show notes, or just visit discoverablebase.com slash Jason Heath. Now, I don't know that book so well, but I also find it inspired. It's so cool to watch someone who's a real seasoned pro, you know, like do, yeah. do that. I, I had the chance to sit in the Hamilton pit in Chicago, not, not the New oh, York, right. but the Chicago with Tom yeah. Mendel, wonderful bass player. And just to watch him do his thing. And, you know, I was had the headphones. I was able to dial in my own mix and like just see. And then the wonderful bass player, Derek Jones, who plays Cirque du Soleil's show, Ka. I got the chance to see him from the musician, uh, uh, pet they have a different name for it i forget but watch him do his thing and then i watch it from the theater and then just the the scale of that and something like cirque du soleil you know that they're relying on these certain musical cues to hit things and you think like wow your bass playing it's almost like <laughs> life or death like how often is your bass playing life or you even miss it the wheel of death might you know you might yeah. m mess something up so it's that it's just incredible and derek uh you know they've been on hiatus with the pandemic although i think they're coming back but i think he did that 13 years Years, eight shows a week, mm -hmm. 13 years. And that book, there's not a sheet of music in sight when you go into that music, uh, the musician's pit. Everybody's playing the show from memory and they've got all these intricate cues. It's it's really wild. Yeah, that's amazing. So how does he does he have a sub at all? I mean, yeah. Oh, it's so it's very you know? it's very complicated to sub for that. Yeah, because you have to <laughs> learn now the sub will get a book. There is a book, but it's just everybody's yeah, yeah, yeah. so long. But yeah, you have to watch so many shows just to get it and and the sub, uh, Jeff Newman was his name. He subbed for a long time. They, they I well, they're, they'll probably get another sub when they come back. Jeff had taken a break, but yeah, it was it was a lot of preparation to walk in there and, and sub in mm -hmm. that. And Derek actually, he appears on stage too in at the end of the show. So he's playing the entire show in this face paint with a mohawk in the pit, and it's uh, it's pretty yeah, interesting. There's so much you can do <laughs> in this music world, and that that theater musician world the pro professional you know those high levels like uh -huh. playing the lion king or 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 something like that it's it's an incredible it's a it's a specific art form in and of itself i think it's really interesting yeah and and uh i totally agree and uh talk in terms of subs what i do know when i um when i moved to new york from boston i really um uh, got in touch with every base i i know someone told me that it's like well you want to Stop. Why don't you contact every co bass player 
playing shows. And I did. I went to the union. I got the book. I found out all the bass players. I think it was like 40, 50 guys. Called them all up. Uh, five, six, or seven called me back. Mm -hmm. Two of them let me, well, more than two, I think three or four, I went to the show. I checked out the show. Two of them gave me the book. And one of them it was um, Steve Mack. I was actually playing Rent for a couple of times. He was awesome. He said, look, I'll be honest to you. I have I have subs. Um, I know you just moved to New York, but I'm. if you really want to learn the book and you know the book, I'll let you play a couple of shows. So I learned the book. I, I remember it took me about three weeks. That's the thing. When you play, when you get the book, and I know that have heard it, and he told me that too. He said it has to be perfect. You know, like if you sub and they're trying out a sub, I think you have like, what I know or what I heard is you have like two tries. And, and you know, if you do a little something, oh, that's okay. But I think the second time has to be perfect, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so if, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, that's it. Being a sub for that show. So my, my move on to some other show. And, um, but he, I took the book home. I learned it. Gave me a recording. I went by his house. He sat in, in his living room. He set up a music stand, put the book up, turned on the tape. He'll play the show. He sat there, you know, he listened to it. It's like, okay, come on by. I let you sit in. He paid me. Uh, he was sitting on the side in the wings of stage. And uh, Rent is a cool show. It was a cool show because you had to, there was some slapping. There was some little thing, all electric bass. There was something with a, with a pick with a you know with a pick you had to play some rock stuff and different styles so i thought it was it was a great challenge and i really learned the show i, I don't know I, I i was at my house um i 40 50 times i went through it I, I just did it over and over and over again and then you know he he let me do it twice you know and i think he paid me i mean i think it, paid me like 170 dollars or something i mean it was i was like wow great you know but he was straightforward from the beginning he said i i, I know you know in town and i do have my sub so don't 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 i don't need a sub you know but he was like you want to learn the show i give you the book you can learn the show and i let you play it a few times and that was it and the second time he said this was he said it was great to know you if i can help you stay in touch you know i mean i i called him up a few times after that i really appreciate the the fact that he let me learn the show and sit in. So I am familiar with, you know, that one show. And then I, I talked to Tom and uh, I, I got the show of Lion King and I recorded it. And he told me also, he said, if you want to stop, you've got to know all the cues in mm -hmm. the storyline. You really have to know, like you said, with Cirque du Soleil, you have to know all the cues when it's going what. And, and um, you know, this was amazing when I, was with him seeing him play the show you sit right next to him i mean i was sitting here was he was right there you know i mean like i mean i could look over it was amazing and he's like in the pit with like 10 12 other musicians i mean it's like I, you know how it feels you're like wow i'm here <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you hear the sound and everything but um yeah that's something else so and then from a sub point of view i know some keyboard players here in town who's who are a sub for like five or six different shows that's what they do and and by being a sub for all these different shows they're subbing so much that that ends up to be like a full-time musician pay so to speak mm -hmm. and um i know that there's one guy i know specifically and uh and that's another art in itself if you just like in this circle of people and you're not only subbing one show but you're familiar with you know two, three, four, five of them, you know, that's like, wow. And uh, what I found out was that um, a lot of times, and Tom Barney said the same things, if you sub, sometimes they want you to play their instruments. You just go and play on their instruments because they want that certain sound. Mm -hmm. I think it was Motown uh, they talked about where they have this Hefner bass, you know, the Beatles bass, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and they... They want you to play that instrument. Some of the shows, you can bring your own instrument. But uh, Tom Barney said to me with the Lion King, he said, well, you can bring you can bring an electric bass, but you have to play this upright bass, you know? And, um, you know, and the, 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 that bass was always there. So that that's the other thing. So you talk about all those different facets of, uh, of course, like, you know, I can see how if you do that for many years, 
how you become familiar with that, but still it's like, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's a lot of, uh, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of different things you need to take in and learn. Yeah, especially somebody who's bouncing around between four or five shows like that. I mean, that is an incredible, that is an incredible, <laughs> uh, just, just to, you know, because it's one thing if you're playing, even if it's something w with all sorts of cues and, the, you know, the complicated, you know, but but if you play The Lion King show after show, week after week, month after month, you're going to just, that's your life, you know. Uh, but mm -hmm. to, to balance that with maybe a few other shows and then maybe you're playing some other, uh, someone else's instrument like you're describing, it's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. What an exciting yeah. place to live and to have that level of that's, you know, I think, I think I've never lived in New York city. I just come and visit, but you know, it's what, a, what an interesting, I could, I could see, I, I can understand how compelling a place it is for any musician. Mm. Well, anybody, but any musician, yeah. particularly somebody in, uh, in the theater world or in the jazz world, certainly. I think mean, there's just no place. Well, there's no place on earth like it really. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, yes, I totally agree. And, and, uh, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I just, I just told the story to someone else. It's like a lot of times, like when I go, home, you know, if I, if, when I have a gig in, in the city, I'm driving home like one o'clock or two in the morning. I'm like, I'm like, wow, I'm in New York. You know, I'm like, I'm still have this thing of, of awe. I'm like so in awe to, 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 to be here. And, uh, you know, I totally, I totally agree. And, and, and then that, that's, that Broadway Zoom they put together, it was really, you know, you have like, I don't know how many, I think I remember 10, maybe there were 15 of these bass players. I'm like having them all to gather together and and hear all these stories. You know, when you when you hear that, I, I'm really aware of that is, that that is a special place, you know, where they all know each other and some of the guys subbed on each other's show. I was like, hey, you know that. And, and then talks to another guy. You remember when I subbed on your show or whatever. It's like, wow. You know, it's like, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And it's the only it's the only city certainly in the United States where like you can come in at one or two in the morning like you're describing and there's still life in the city you know I like some of my favorite yeah. memories are like walking around New York City eating Korean food at one in the morning <laughs> you know like that doesn't happen here in San Francisco this is a major city but we're a sleepy town we shut down at eleven. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I think that's yeah. most of most of America, really most of the world. It's it's just yeah. it's uh, that energy is just um, incredible. Yeah, I you mentioned the energy. That's really what attracted me the most because when I was, you know, when I when I was finished at Boston, I had the chance to. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you know that, but I'm I you know my Brian Bromick is one of my mentors and really close mm -hmm. friends. So. When I was finished at Berkeley, he's like, come on, come to LA, you know? And I'm kind of like, I'm, my birthday is in August, you know, I like sunshine, you know, I like the beach. I'm like, oh man, Los Angeles, great, you know? But then I had this, I was intrigued by New York City, the energy, it's just what you said. It's like, like it's so, the energy in this town is so vibrant and, and uh, intimidating. I, mean, I was very intimidated when, you know, even moving here, I was just like, oh my God, what am I doing, you know? But make a long story short, I knew if I would move to LA, I would never get the courage and the inspiration uh, back together to, to move to New York again. So I knew that I had to go to New York first. And if things work out great, I would stay for a little while. And then eventually I always saw myself moving to Los Angeles, you know, but I'm, I'm still here, you know, like what, 18 years later, 16 years later or something. And, um, and it's the energy, the energy I, I feel what you talk about is the, I, the energy. I, f I feel the energy now, you know, I, and it's something which has nothing to do with the instrument. It's just something, it's just, it's just there. And you pick up on it. If I, you know, if I practice or not, if I feel good about my playing or not, it's like, you know, you, you tap into this energy field. I'm like, wow, you know, this, it's just the energy is just kind of, which, which um, I feel it too. Anyway, I just want to, corroborate your statement about the energy which which um, has nothing to do with the music and has everything to do with the music you know yeah. but it's it's uh, you know it's yeah you go in the middle of the night and sometimes you know i don't know if it happened to you but i'm sure sometimes you run into someone like early in the morning like what are you doing here <laughs> <It's> like, 
<laughs> oh, it's my favorite place too. I want. I like my Korean food or whatever. You just like you do run into people sometimes in the middle of the night. You know. Yeah. I remember in the in the, in the very first days I didn't recognize him, but my when I was in Boston, I made trips to New York, and then my mom came from Germany. We went to, you know, we went to an Airbnb. Uh, back then, I think as you still call them bed and breakfast, but we were staying up on the east side uh, for a couple of nights, and we were walking down the street. So she she saw this actor, which I didn't notice at all. This French actor Gerard Depardieu. Oh sure, if, yeah. Uh, if you know him, you know. Oh yeah. But I was just walking with my mom, walking down the street, and and she's like, she she grabbed my hand, you know. She was like, <laughs> 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 I, th- I thought something happened, you know. And she's like, but Gerard Depardieu, you know, it's like. And he just walked by here like a trench coat on and you know i mean back then it's i don't know it's like 20 years ago or something but it's like you do run into people and it's like, like yeah it's this guy walking down the street you know <laughs> so yeah like, so I remember, like, like turning into stone you know he's like that's the last thing she expected him to run into and and you know he's very well known in europe obviously and uh and it's also known in the states but i think he was first known in europe and then he took some. I think the movie he became famous was called The Green Card or something like that. I, I remember that. Big, sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I remember, you know, you, you run into some different people. You know, that that was my last in-person podcast, Christian. You and me, man. <laughs> that was the last time I've, I've talked with. So, but I, but in-person podcasts are coming back. I know they're coming back. So I I yeah, did a, yeah. I, I, on one of these trips here. I did a few uh, video interviews for a project I'm working on. So, but you're you are you uh, yeah. That was I, I didn't know it was going to be my last in person. But, uh. <laughs> How little did we know? It was pretty amazing. Uh, you know that, that so so Steve always is funny. Steve Bailey always always um, some of those Zoom meetings he starts out. So where were you when COVID hit? You know, so <laughs> you, have, you have all these stories. You know, but but let me ask you. So where were you when when I mean when did if this was if I was your last in February? I think what happened after that, and when did you catch back on with the podcast? Did did, did you? Uh, obviously you're starting now doing that on zoom as well, but did you, how did you switch and what was your process well, well, after I'd, that? I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. No, I'd all, I'd always done like Skype or FaceTime or what, whatever podcast I started using zoom cause the whole world discovered zoom last year, but, but, um, <laughs> but I'd been going into trying to do more of them in person, like what we did, you know, cause I, yeah. I do a lot of travel and it's fun to get together. So I just kind of went back to what I used to do. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal, but, but I was, I, I was in Idaho and then I went to Pittsburgh right after that. So like the first week of March, I was in Pittsburgh and then we came back here and then we had a uh, San Francisco. Francisco base event yeah like mm-hmm. March 10th maybe yeah and, and flew a bass player from Philadelphia named Xavier Foley and that was this weird moment where they said that it was for high school students but they said well the, the students can't come but you can still have the event so this poor guy flew across the country just for my <laughs> video camera and then we played a bass quartet for that and then that was the last time my bass has left my my condo because uh, then wow. San Francisco shut down I think on March 16th and mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it's, uh, so it's been interesting, but, but, um, yeah, the, the pot, I mean, all of a sudden everybody's home, you know, for a year. So it's been, it hasn't been hard to connect with people, but I am looking yeah. forward to doing what I, what I had been doing. Cause I like going and meeting people and hanging out with them in person, yeah. and bringing some microphones. And so, but this is easy uh, of course too. And this works. And so it's, it's yeah. a problem. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, one thing about Tom Barney, uh, coming back to the Zoom meetings, I don't know, I, I followed a lot of them, so I'm talking about them because they did inspire me a lot. This was funny, out of all the people, everyone had a long story about what happened when COVID hit, and I was here, and I was uh, at the airport, and Tom Barney playing Lion King. <laughs> he's like, so, 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 it's like, so how's COVID for you? He's like, I'm loving it. This is the best ever. <laughs> I love it. I don't miss anything. <laughs> it's like, wow. It's the guy who's playing Lion King for 13, 14 years. He, he said, I like, I, he was, I mean, it was great. He said, I enjoy having time off. I'm doing things I never thought I have time to doing. And I'm just enjoying life, you know? And that was like, wow, you know, that I remember that, you know, because I know him quite well. You know, he, um, 
I was close to Bob Crenshaw and he was very close to Bob Crenshaw, um, you know, I mean, for a long time. But when um, it's a funny story, when I moved to Boston, uh, to New York, there was a, a bass player, not uh, the Richard Evans, but another Richard Evans bass player, composer teaching at Berkeley College of Music, who uh, I worked with a lot together and um, at the college. And he, and he liked my bass playing and. I was actually at some point, my bass was in the shop and he said, come on, play my bass. And I picked up his bass. I played on it. And he was very, very close with Bob Crenshaw. And he said, when, when I, when he had told him I moved to New York, he said, you have to get in touch with Bob Crenshaw. And I did. And um, it's funny how they knew each other, Richard Evans and Bob Crenshaw. They went together to the Korean war. They were actually soldiers in the Korean war. And, and uh, Richard Evans said, Bob Crenshaw was so scared. He said, if he saw something in the bush moving, he would sw he would throw a hand grenade. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like anything which was moving, he's like, boom, it's moving. Or, you know, that was a funny story. So when I went, so he did this phone call, he called Bob Crenshaw and he said, when you come, you know, he called him, he said, this, you know, Christian's coming to New York. I called Bob and Bob was a very, a uh, big advocate for the Musicians Union in New York. He had a great pension. He played Sesame Street, as you know, and a lot of great Broadway shows. So through Bob, I'm, I met some of the other bass players. He was mentoring, and, and Tom Barney was um, one of them. And he's like, he's like a son to me. You got to meet him. And it was through Bob that I met Tom and got to know Tom a little better. And, uh, and Bob recommended that I would go and check out Lion King. So that's how I came to, to, met, to meet uh, Tom Barney. Um, but over the years, I, I ran into Tom at the NAMM show and he's playing, I uh, forgot what he's playing. I think he's playing, I could be wrong. I mean, don't take my word for it, but I thought he was playing Carvin. And I mm -hmm. remember he was hanging out at the booth with uh, Brian Bromberg and, and I play my little bass guitars. It's uh, this German bass builder with a French name. And uh, so I walked Tom, over and said, hey, check out these bases. I mean, they, we, we just hung out at the NAMM show, which is a great hang, as you know. It's, it's, yep. it's, it's really, really cool. But, but that's how I got to know Tom. So when I saw Tom at the Zoom meeting, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I think he was part of the, he was part of the Steely Dan uh, rhythm section players on the Miles Davis. I mean, he played with Miles too. Um, either one or the other, but also played with Steely Dan. And uh, I, rem I just remember that from... Uh, you know, his response to his like, he kind of expecting another crazy story. And he's like, no, man, I, I'm, I have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's just like, I love it. You know, like, cool. You know, it's like, I mean, everyone has a different take on it. So, so it was just great to hear his uh, response to that. Yeah. No kidding. No, it's great to see that some people, yeah, I, I can understand, especially if you've been playing something like the Lion King for so long to just have a little break and take some downtime. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a, a few months of downtime was nice. I started to go a little stir crazy, uh, after, you know, late 2020, yeah. early 2021. So it's been nice to, to get back. So do you make it out to the NAMM show sometimes? It sounds like. I, yeah, I used to, I used to go, uh, since 2010, 11, I'm playing, um, uh, you might know her, Ariana Cab. She's a bass player. From yeah, the, yeah, sure. She used to be in the Bay Area. I just found out it's true somewhere. She didn't tell me. I just saw a post. Oh, maybe you should move to Nashville. And before I know it, she moved to Nashville. So uh, she introduced me to um, um, a fellow German bass builder, uh, Gerald Malo or Gerald Malo, however you want to pronounce it. And um, I was going to the name show. Uh, with Wally Gator Watson, which I mentioned through the Lionel Hampton Big Band, I was there once or twice. He told me to come and it was a great hang, but I was I, I was still at Berkeley, the end or beginning uh, when I just finished college. And and I don't know, I was, I, I, I didn't really get a lot out of it because I didn't know anyone. So you kind of like, you know, just go to there. You see an, another great bass player, like, oh, wow, great. You know, but I was very pretty shy. I was, you know, I, I didn't really get the hang of it. So through Ariane, I, I met uh, Gerald Malo and, um, and, and he needed some help at the NAMM show. He's, um, his English is great, but it's not entirely fluid. Um, and, and, and 
he speaks well, but um, he told me then when sometimes a guy comes to him and just tells him a long story, he's like, it just goes right, right <laughs> over his head. And I know how it feels when, when I had to learn English and I came to LA the very first time I was in Los Angeles when I came to the States. And I kind of, so I started helping him out a little bit. Ariana was there too, but Ariana, as you know, was also very, um, you know, she's involved into a lot of different things. She just would come, drop off her base and, and then zoom off to different kind of zoom, be over there, go to night travel, no travel or, or have things to do. And then we would play at the booth too. And I, but I, I didn't really know too many people, but I, this, because of him, um, you know, I was every year, every other year. I mean, I, I, it seems like every three, four years, there's a year I cannot make it, but um, I was going to the NAMM show and hanging out. And and then over the years, you, you learn to get to know some other guys. And then I also did the uh, Victor Wooten base nature camps. I did the base nature workshop uh, and camp in 2012. And then I did the spirit of music in 2012. And I did the base nature camp again in 2014. Mm. which was kind of interesting because that was the first time they offered the base nature camp for credit. So if you at that time would study at Berkeley College of Music, you would get one credit for the um, uh, base uh, nature camp accredited to Berkeley College of Music, which I thought was awesome. So I, I thought I, I felt like really inspired. I thought I should be there. You know, I, I thought it was a good reason to return. So I did the base nature camp again in 2014. And then I obviously, because Steve and Victor and, you know, the, but there's a lot of other great bass players teaching there, you know, Anthony mm -hmm. Wellington, uh, you know, a bunch of other great bass players. And then had a great, has a great visiting also has this element of surprise guests at the, at the wooden woods, you know, sometimes he said, Oh, we got, some great surprise guests and before you know it it's a billy sheehan dropping by or or Stu ham you know um mike mannering is like whoa you know it's like great that's <laughs> like you know you already feel like you are special because you made it to a, a wooden camp but but you know victor has this thing he it's really amazing he makes people feel special in a way where there's always a surprise for something you know it's like I remember he came to New York and he did something at the base collective. And then, you know, suddenly because you bought a ticket, there was some free stuff, you know, it's like always a little, you know, like, I think what, what is amazing about him, he always gives more than you expect. And it's like, and, and, and he is already Victor Wooten and he's doing all these great things and, and you're already happy to be there anyway, but then you get always, you know, there's always another surprise or always an extra thing there. It's like, um, which is, they transferred into the Zoom meetings. I mean, Steve is doing the same thing with the Zoom meetings. It's always a surprise guest or always something extra. And I think it's really, um, I really inspired me to get that element into uh, the Sitka Jazz Workshop, you know, when we did the Zoom meeting last time. And, and also, um, we, we, we did the Sitka Jazz Workshop on Zoom. I started it 10 years ago. It's our 10th year this year, and we're going to do it on Zoom again. Um, it's uh, July 18 to the 23rd. Um, but I try to incorporate that element of surprise. I think it's really awesome when you're a, a participant in a workshop or a Zoom call, and then suddenly something unexpected happened, which is like mm -hmm. making it even more special that you that you present at this thing, you know? So make a long story short because of the wooden woods at the same time i got to know victor and steve and i would run into them at the name show and then you go more often you meet more people and then suddenly it becomes this thing where you're like it's cool you know sometimes you're playing great sometimes you're not you know and i never i never um you know how you know people are after gear you know you're trying to get <laughs> gear you know right I don't know. It's like, I, I, you're laughing. So you know what I'm talking about. So never occurred to me to, I'm like, I was just happy I was there, you know? And then a couple of you said, I'm like, man, I, I like this damn, you know, let me talk to him. You know, I like that speaker. This is really cool. Maybe, maybe I should introduce myself. And, and sometimes they saw you too. And you just struck up a conversation. You're like, 
oh wow, you know, maybe I remember the first NAMM show I got this, uh, isn't there, there's a cable called Zoom too, right? Isn't there like an electronic cable or something? Maybe, maybe. there are too many companies called Zoom. Because <laughs> I, 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 I'm talking to you on the Zoom hand recorder, right? And then we're talking over Zoom telecommunications or whatever. And then I, th I think you're right. There's something else, yeah. A zone or something, but I know I yeah. got this guy from uh, from Switzerland and, and he had this cable and it was really a great cable. It was like gold-plated something and I, I, I just, it, it's like $125 and I, I mean, you know, it, it's back then, I mean, I'm, it still is a lot of money for me, you know, I'm like, and I walk over and say, man, you know, could, do you think I could, I mean, I, we're trying this cable at the, the Malo booth and it's really great. I really like it. It's light. I travel a lot. I put it in my, you know, I'm, I, I know, you know, I'm, um, that's another cool story, yeah. but um, I just walk over there. It's like, man, could I have a cable? It's like, yeah, I take it. It's fine. I'm like, whoa. I'm like, <laughs> you're like, you feel like you hit a gold mine. You know, it's like, it's like, wow, I got a free cable. But it took me a couple of years to just like figure out what, you know, that you can actually ask someone to either uh, introduce yourself because you like the equipment or you're actually considering something using it. And, and they're totally open. It's like, yeah, try it out. You know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Phil Jones is, uh, you know, I have a, a little amp and, and I got a little carbon amp, you know, and and, um, and uh, I got to know uh, Epifani, you know, uh, um, Nick Epifani. It's like, and then I'm starting with Ron and, and he's using Epifani. It's like, so it takes, I mean, I'm, I guess other guys are faster than me, you know, but it's like at some point you're like, you're putting one and one together. It's like, wow, you know, this is really great equipment, you know, and um and uh, some of the stuff is like uh, with Malo, we don't, he doesn't do an exclusive. I mean, you know, I mean, I love playing Malo. I will never play a different bass guitar for the rest of my life. But, uh, you know, he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I know some other guys who play Malo basses. They have a, you know, they might have a Sadowski. They might have a, I don't know, this Italian name, I forgot, fretless bass or, you know, so it's like, you know, you realize it's different unless you're like a top player, you know, you know, people are just happy that you try out their equipment and that you hopefully you will use it. You know, I mean, I'm not going overly crazy with that, but um, I, I do um, a great story. It's like when, when um, we played in February, right after, right before I met you, we played Birdlin with the Lionel Hampton Big Band for an entire week. It was huge because the last time, I played there was with Lionel Hampton and he, and he passed the same year. So it was 19 years ago that we played with a big band. And um, I just got the Epiphany amp because I saw Ron using the Epiphany amp. And I'm like, man, I should, I should really, I like his sound and mm -hmm. I'm kind of trying to find different things. And, and um, so, but I didn't have enough money for the speaker. So I, I said to Ron, he's the only one I knew. I'm like, and I studied with him. I said, Mr. Carter, is it, would it be okay to to um, use your speaker for we, we have to speak with the Hamburg band? I'm really concerned about a good sound and I, I, I want to do the best I can. And I, I hopefully we be returning there with the line Hamburg band. Well, just before the lockdown. <laughs> so he called me up. Like out of the blue, I see my phone, Ron Carter, I pick up the phone, and then he's a funny guy, you know, he's like Mr. Fabian, I have a proposition for you. I'm like, yes. It's like, would you, could you consider using my setup for playing at Birdland? I said, yes. <laughs> it's like, well, but I want you to get this book of mine, you know? And, and it's like, no problem. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I got the book and then of course we used the book in the lessons and, and not only that, but he said, I want you to have the best sound experience possible. So not only can you use my equipment, but you are able, I will give you my sound guy for the entire week. Wow. <laughs> uh, which is That's Sergio cool. La Laros. I don't know if you, uh, if you know him, you know, it's like Sergio is a sound guy. So he called up Sergio and I had to meet him for the sound check. You know, I picked up at, at Ron's house. So Ron brought the equipment down Sergio was there. We loaded up my car. We went to Birdland. We set up the equipment. We did the sound check. We did the first night, everything. And every night, 
Sergio was there. You know, he was there at the beginning, you know, and then we talked at the break. And then usually he wouldn't stay till the entire end, but we just, you know, we, we talked a little bit and he said, sounds really good. Maybe, maybe roll off this a little bit, you know, and he walked around the room. It was amazing to have that experience. And, uh, and it was really, you know, that's, that's another thing what I learned about these great bass players. You know, that's another thing. I mean, it's, it's this thing when you, when you study with Ron, you, sometimes, although I'm him, with him for six years, but there was one of those moments I did not expect that. <laughs> All I asked for was a speaker. <laughs> yeah. And I ended up with the entire, with the amp and his amp and his speaker and the sound guy. So I already had the Epifani amp. So what we did after two nights, Sergio said, he said, I really want you to use your amp. I want you to get comfortable with your amp. So the, the, so we started on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday on, on, uh, I think on Wednesday or Thursday night, we, we switched out the amp and then we used my amp with Ron's setup, with Ron's speaker and everything. And, and it was really, you know, it, 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 it was, it was a great lesson. It was a really great experience to, to go through, um, Christian, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, learn more at christianfabian.com. What a cool person. Somebody that I get inspired by whenever I chat with him. It is Labor Day today. I do not like recording on holidays, but I am about to head out to South Texas with George Amarim to do a concert, a 9-11 memorial concert, and we'll be doing a couple other things as well. More details on that as, or details about what we did <laughs> after that's done. And then I go to Nashville to record with Discover Double Bass. So I am uh, squeezing this in with the time right before I head out to South Texas. So this is going to be a quick outro. I sit down and do four of these episodes in a row if you listen. So this is one of four. So I need to give the bath the dog and it is a beautiful day here in San Francisco. So we need to go take advantage. But I'd like to thank the team that helped to put these together. They are Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Kilgore, Texas, a bit east of there. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. I am your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Thank you.